Daniel Jeremiah, I'm just going to ask you to start by by summing up how you see this draft, where it might be strong, where it might not be strong, and where are the positions of strength in this draft? Well, that's a good question, Peter. To me, I, edge rusher is where I would start, and uh, you know, with the one caveat being, we can we can just record my answer for this every year and just say wide receivers for the next twenty years, and just know that every year we're going to see a, a total a, a, a massive amount of wideouts every single year we see it. But pass rushers this year to me stands out just from the depth, you know, coming off the edge. You can go really, really deep. I just updated my top 50, and I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six of my top 17 players, um, or six of my top 18 players are edge rushers. So um, it is a really, really deep group. Have you ever had that many before? I'd have to go back and look, but that's a big number. Um, Yeah. You know, so it's it's really really strong there, and then you've got some some other positions where I think there's uh, there's a lot of depth, but maybe not that top end group. You know, I, I think when you look at the tight ends, there's going to be good tight ends. You're going to get the fourth, fifth, maybe even into the sixth round. I I really like the running back group. Um, you know, there's no there's no Adrian Peterson. There's no you know nobody that's going to you know have that debate. Do we take a guy in the first round or not? I don't think that's happening this year, but man, there's a lot of depth in those middle rounds at that position. And tackle is, uh, is another one. I think that's pretty well represented both with some solid players at the top um, and then some really good depth all the way through. Can you tell me why it seems to you that, and, and whether it seems to you that this is a very strong depth draft I've heard you talk about how, you know, third, fourth, and fifth rounds, you're going to get some great players. You did your conference call the other day, and you had a great line that, you know, somebody's, and I'm going to paraphrase, somebody's 15th player in this draft could be somebody else's 60th player in this draft, which is not totally rare, but you think that will be kind of commonplace this year. Yeah, and I think we're starting to see more of that over over the years where teams, you know, just in terms of how you evaluate what you value, I should say, um, determines how you slot these guys. It's, you know, it's a flavor draft. What kind of flavor do you want? You know, the receiver position is a great example of that. You want kind of the big power forward wide receiver. Then you've got some of those guys, you know, with the Drake Londons and the Traylon Burks, or you want the, the real speed guys. You know, you've got Jamison Williams, Jahan Dotson, and Chris Olave or you know, all big time speedsters. And then you've got kind of the in-between guys with with Garrett Wilson. I mean, that's just that's just one position where you're gonna have teams with orders all over the map. Um, and then um, uh, you know, it's it's funny. You talk to the teams that are picking up high in this draft, and there's almost a sense of frustration that you can get from them. And then you talk to the teams that are picking down in the bottom of the round and they're pretty excited about what they're going to be staring at, what they're going to be getting. So it's a, it's a different draft from that standpoint. You know, I was in touch with Les Snead today. I, I sent him a, uh, uh, a, a few stats that I'm going to be using in my column on Monday uh, because I think one of the things that I really admire about the Rams is that they don't have any fear about getting rid of their ones and twos because they have drafted so well, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after the second round. And and I'll just give you a little flavor of that because I want to hear if some team, you know, with more picks like in the middle rounds this year could kind of do a Rams thing. So I'll just give you a little example of what I'm talking about with the Rams. 12 players on their roster this year played more than 30% of the snaps. And those 12 players were drafted in the third round or later in simply the last five drafts. In other words, since Sean McVay arrived and, you know, uh, you know, two starting offensive linemen, David Edwards, Brian Allen, a safety, Jordan Fuller, obviously Cooper cup, you know, the 69th pick, the seventh wide receiver pick in 2017. Uh, Troy Reader, undrafted linebacker, defensive tackle, Greg Gaines. Every time Aaron Donald opens his mouth about the guys around him, he says, this Greg Gaines, he he can't be blocked. Mm -hmm. Nick Scott, the safety who came in late this year and who at Penn State was really only a special teams player. 
or, or almost exclusively a special teams player, at least until his last year there. And so I just wonder, could we be getting into, could that be a little bit of a trend going forward that teams don't just fall in love with getting ones and, oh, we got to get into the top 10. I mean, unless you want a quarterback, yeah. but they just believe that there's a lot of depth at other positions. Do you see that or do you not think that that is happening right now? Well, I'm glad you brought it up because I feel like with the Rams, we talk about the trades more so than we talk about anything else. And they've, they've traded and smartly so, you, you know, for quarterback, corner, edge rusher. So they're trading premier picks for premier players at premier positions. And you went through the list of players that they, you know, that you talked about outside the first round and outs, you know, in the middle rounds where they've hit on guys. Every year, Peter, you can find wide receivers, safeties, linebackers, guards. You can find those in the middle rounds every single year. Yep. But, man, if you're hunting for quarterbacks and edge rushers, those those are going to cost you. And usually it's going to cost you with spending a first-round pick and drafting a guy or, in their case, you know, using some picks to trade to go get established veteran players. But I think that's kind of the genius behind what they've done and that they've, they've invested with draft cap and dollars in the premier players at premier positions and then they're content and understanding the whole comp system to be able to say okay these middle rounds we're going to find our linebackers our safeties we can find our wide receivers um, and we're going to have to be we have to be comfortable with the fact that when some of these contracts come up they're going to walk away and we're going to get comp threes and fours and we're going to have to keep shopping for those things in those middle rounds but I think it's 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 a nice, it's a nice way of doing things when you have the pillars in place, you know, but if you're an organization that doesn't have your quarterback in place or you don't have edge rushers, it's hard, it's hard to hit on those guys, those premier guys at those positions outside of the first round. You know, I like the fact that you, you just bring up the receiver position because to me, when I look at receivers, receivers, are what I thought of running backs like five years ago. I, I've been on this, why in the world would you take a running back high? Yeah. I mean, because time after time after time, and it's not just in the Denver system, you know, that use the, the, the low round picks. But if you consider how many really good wide receivers or, or, or at least usable good wide receivers, you know, and I'll just have been picked late. 172 uh, four years ago, Isaiah McKenzie, 149, Hunter Renfro, 128, Gabriel Davis, 112, Amon Ross St. Brown. And I just look at the depth of receiver that college football is producing. And I say, hey, listen, unless you're Justin Jefferson, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, who you absolutely Chase. know. Yeah. Yeah. is going to blow you away early. I'm fine with waiting. I, I really am interested in your thought on that at the receiver position. Yeah, I was going to say you could just refer to it as the old Miss rule because if you just go to old Miss, if you just go to old Miss wideouts in the second round, you come up with DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, and Elijah Moore. That's just one school, <laughs> what they've produced outside yeah. of the first round. So yeah, you can absolutely find those guys. I would say when you um, you know, the Bengals made the right decision last year. Uh, taking the Jamar chases don't, those guys don't come right. around very often. So you, you don't pass up those, but I think you have to distinguish between those, you know, kind of where you are. Um, but this is a draft and in saying that, and I'm with you, I think you can find those guys and this is a good deep draft, but in this draft where maybe there's not as much certainty high in the draft. And, um, you know, you look at a guy to me, like a Garrett Wilson, who's, you know, I think is going to be an outstanding player who checks every single box. And I think it's a safer pick, man. If you don't fall in love with anybody else, yeah, I wouldn't have any problem with the team doing that. But like you said, you're going to get into the second, third, fourth round. And it's not, it's not something that's a recent trend. It's where we are. Every college in the country is playing with four, four and five wide outs and throwing it all over the place. And every year we have just a, a you know, barrel of wide outs to choose from. I thought it was really interesting when I did something in my column last week about Mike McDaniel telling Debo Samuel, who obviously was another lesser pick, not a low pick, but, yeah. but a lesser pick, um, and telling Debo Samuel, look, if you do everything I ask you to do, work and, and, and all this stuff, you do everything, you'll be an all pro and I'll be a head coach in the NFL next year. Wow. And both those things happen. 
I only bring that up because my feeling is that I think you have to know the personality and who these people are. Like, you know, Jamar Chase, I, I'm fine after seeing who he is and sort of the tough guy that he is. And, you know, I've gotten to know Zach Taylor some, and I don't know Jamar, Jamar Chase, but Zach Taylor goes, you know, he's the most competitive guy we got and, and all that. And I think that with guys like, uh, you know, Jamar Chase and Debo Samuel and, and Terry McLaurin mm -hmm. and Hunter Renfro and a lot of these guys, I think tools are so common at that position that I'm looking for other stuff when I'm looking for wide receivers. So I want to ask you, give me your three or four receivers in this draft who've got some some of that in them, who've got some of the Cooper Cup, I will not be denied in him that is going to add to just his his uh, his football resume. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd give you my, my top three guys at the top of the board fit that in terms of the criteria. Garrett Wilson, who plays a lot bigger in his size, super tough. You can watch what he does after the catch to see his competitiveness and his toughness. Drake London, who's just kind of a – He's kind of a bully. You know, there's been a big debate on, is he too tall? I, I don't have any issues with him whatsoever uh, in that regard. I think. Will you tell me it. a little bit about Drake London? It, yeah. This is like the first week I start talking to people around the league about the draft and, and I'm, he's on everybody's lips right now or everybody's tongue right now. So, and this, uh, let me go backwards before I go forwards. If you look at the guys last year uh, receivers and you look at the top guys in the league, I just pulled up the list. Cooper cup. Justin Jefferson, Devontae Adams, Jamar Chase, Debo Samuel, Tyree Kill. Let's just look at those guys right there. You say, okay, what do they have in common? They're all different sizes. They're all different speeds. Those guys all have phenomenal play strength. Like that is that is a, a characteristic that I've been trying to search for now when I'm looking at these guys this year. Who, who is strong? Strong getting off the line, strong at the top of your route, strong going after the football, and strong after the catch. Um, and that, to me, Drake London checks all a lot of those boxes in terms of what he can do. He's physical at the line. He's physical at the top. He wins 50, 50 balls. Then after the catch, he's not a catch and fall down guy. Like he can, he can run you over. He can make you miss. Um, and everything from the school that you get is that the wiring is just outstanding, like ultra, ultra competitive. Uh, when we finish here, I'll send you a text of a, uh, of a dunk of trade of Trey London's by okay. the way, uh, which I always love when I get the other sports stuff, but he was, you know, he played basketball at USC his freshman year. So he's, wow. he's a big time athlete. You know, what's interesting about him that to me, and, and again, I haven't studied any of these guys really, but he, he only played eight games this year, right? Because yeah. he, he got a broken ankle. He's okay. Isn't he right now? Uh, yeah, I don't imagine we'll be doing much at the combine, I would guess, coming off that injury, but I do not right. know yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he, he he only played eight games, but 88 catches in eight games. <laughs> and the other thing that's really incredible, PFF had a stat about him, 19 con contested catches. That's yeah. like two and a half contested catches a game. That That just, that doesn't happen. Well, the funny thing is, is I've had conversations. It's a glass half full, glass half empty. I've had conversations with teams that really love Drake London, and they'll say, man, he's got so many contested catches. And then I've talked to teams that aren't as high on him and go, you know, it's all contested catches. You know, he doesn't separate. So I'm like, you take the exact same nugget, the exact same <laughs> stat. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I, I tend to, to fall in the camp of loving what he does there. Yeah. Yeah. How is Garrett Wilson different from him? So Garrett Wilson has more juice. He's just, he's going to, he's faster. He's more explosive. Um, he's going to be a more dynamic route runner. I mean, he's just, he can, he's just going to be able to get in and out. And uh, I'll send you another one of my favorite things. We'll show it at the, at the combine, but uh, you got to go back and watch Garrett Wilson and his freshman year. You know, it's not just looking at these guys, the, their recent year, but you go back to his freshman year, they're playing uh, Clemson. And he goes up and makes a catch on the sideline, Peter. That's as good a catch as any that I've, I've ever seen. I mean, he just can jump out of the gym. And wow. he reminds me of Justin Jefferson in that I loved everything about Justin Jefferson. I thought he was, you know, the best route runner in that draft. I thought everything he did was really clean. The question was, oh, what about the top, top speed? Like, is he going to be, 
was expectation. He might run in the low four fives, which is, you know, doesn't mean he's not going to be a great receiver. We see that with Devontae Adams and Stephon Diggs, all these guys. He goes to the combine and runs in the four threes. And it's like, well, okay, mm-hmm. well, that he's good there. And I've been told that Garrett Wilson's been, he's been training and running in the high four threes himself. So he's, right. that's the last little hurdle for him. And, and, and I think you'll, you'll be one of the easier evaluations in this class. What about, you know, this is a guy who I only know by name, but Jameson Williams, I think coming into this year, you know, what I had heard is that he had a very good chance to be the best receiver in the class. Tears his ACL uh, in January. And I wonder, how do you look at Jamison Williams now? And do you believe he'll be able to play football this year? Okay, I'm, I'm going to answer that question while you check your phone because I text, texted you the Drake London dunk. So I want to okay, right, get the Peter King reaction to that. Uh, but Jamison <laughs> Williams, if Jamison Williams doesn't get hurt, I think here's a real chance he's the first wide receiver that gets picked. Um, oh, he's yeah. got rare, rare speed. And on top of that, I, he's somebody that you can actually see him run some routes and, and drop his weight. Sometimes those super fast guys, you can be too fast, but you'll see him get to the top of his route. He can get in and out of breaks. He can do those things. Um, so I, I, I think somebody in the bottom of the first round is going to just take him and say, okay, we've, you know, maybe we have to sit him for half the year as he recovers from this injury, but it's a straight ACL. He should be back and be fine. And that could end up being one of the best value picks. In the time we have left, uh, in our podcast, I want you, if you can, to tell me a little bit about the very top of the draft. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one of those things that you hear, you know, maybe some people like Aiden Hutchinson, you know, the edge rusher for Michigan to be the top pick. Some people might like Kayvon Thibodeau uh, from Oregon to be the top pick. If you desperately need a corner, maybe you could fall in love with Derek Stingley Jr., uh, the LSU guy. But just give me your view on how you break down the absolute top of this draft. Well, for me, and and just kind of putting together my top 50 and just updating that, I try and take the approach of uh, what gives me the best chance at success here. So I I don't get too pulled by, okay, this is what they can be, and this is kind of that, that upside. To me, if I'm picking up there in the top five, my team stinks, and I need guys that I know can come in and make a difference on my football team. So I'm trying to eliminate as much risk as I can while still getting a really, really good player. So when I factor all those things in Aiden Hutchinson comes out at the top of the list for me um, and I don't want to insult him by saying he's just a high floor player I mean the gosh the guy was a dominant player last year at Michigan I think he's got a chance to be a double digit you know consistently double digit sack guy in the NFL now does that he's not the Bosa brothers he's not Miles Gary he's not Chase Young he's not those guys uh, but he's a really really good player and I think he provides very little risk so that's why I put him at the at the very top and then right behind him, uh, Akeem Ikwanu from NC State, uh, who I think is the best offensive exactly, lineman in the draft. Yeah. And he's yeah. also somebody that, you know, you, t- you say, okay, well, where's the risk at? Now there's some things he needs to clean up in pass protection. He's got it all, all the ability in his body. I think that's going to come. But I've also seen him, when you watch him last year at guard, and I've seen him just pulverize people at guard. So I, I know this guy can play inside and be a dominant guard. That's the absolute worst case scenario for him. But, uh, you know, that's why I think he's another one who's who's got very little risk with him going forward. So he was two. Kyle Hamilton, um, there's a debate about safeties. You know, how valuable, how high do you take a safety? Are they difference makers? I, you know, I think in today's game, when you've got guys with that type of versatility and range um, and can be as dominant against the pass as he is against the run, you know, I see it with, with Derwin James doing the Charger games every week. You, those guys can impact the game in a major way. So uh, he's another one, again, very little risk. And then those are the top three. And then after that, the next couple guys, I get to Sauce Gardner for me is the best corner in the draft. Um, you know, I was around Chris McAllister. To me, I see some of those skills from him. Um, and then the next one would be Evan Neal for, uh, for Alabama, who is, is not there yet. But he's another one who's actually played guard. I think it was in 2019 and played that well. So you've got a fallback for some reason if it didn't work. Um, but somebody that got better. When I watched him at the, at, over the summer, then in the beginning of this year, the middle of this year, the end of this year, he got better each time uh, I was exposed to him and watching him. So uh, that gives me a lot, a, a lot of hope on, on him going forward. And when you're trying to figure out what the heck the Jags are going to do, 
man, that's the difference between stacking it for how I think, you know, of them as players is easy. Trying to climb inside the head of the Jags and, and what they're going to do with that first overall pick is a little more challenging. Well, if you look at Jacksonville, you can either say uh, we could get a franchise left tackle, which we really need, or a franchise tackle on either side, which we really need. And then secondly, um, you can also get a pass rusher to sort of, uh, you know, to be a bookend to Josh Allen. Yeah. So, uh, and Josh Allen, I think, started to come on a little bit this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think he's got a chance to, to he's not going to be Miles Garrett, but I think he's going to be okay. So I, I think the Jaguars are in a pretty good position, a pretty enviable position. Just, just the way I look at it. Let, let me ask you a question then, because this is the hard part, right? Do, you know, evaluating them and giving your opinions one thing, but trying to figure out what these teams are going to do. So when I've tried to figure out the Jags, I hear everything you just said, but I'm sitting here saying, okay, if we fast forward a year from now, Peter, and let's say the Jags are 5-12 and 12 with a defense that's kept them in every game and the quarterback hasn't made much progress, or next year the exact same record, they're 5-12 and 12, and the quarterback takes the next step. As an organization, I think you would sign up for the quarterback moving forward, which is why I give him an offensive lineman with that first pick because they've yeah. got to get him up and going. Well, and, and not only maybe giving him the NC State guy, uh, you know, as the tackle right away, but with the 33rd pick, they can choose from, you know, who knows? Yeah. There's going to be a very good receiver at 33. And if they're in love with somebody who's still there at 25, you know, they can, they can trade up. Mm-hmm. They got two fives, two sixes, two sevens. So they've got some ammo to do some stuff this year. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, one last thing here uh, on the podcast. It's, I found your discussion when, when I was listening to your conference call to be very interesting in this regard. A lot of people look at this draft as uh, who do you like better, Aiden Hutchinson, you know, or Thibodeau from from Oregon. You were significantly in Aiden Hutchinson's corner. Tell me Mm why. Well, it's the elimination of risk. I I think when you when you watch Hutchinson and you compare him with Thibodeau, I think. Number one, he's got more ways to get to the quarterback. Um, he's really, really polished. So he's got a, a lot of tools in his bag that I don't think Thibodeau has at this point in time. I think they both have a little bit of ankle tightness, which which limits them. Um, so that's just as, you know, in terms of their skill sets. And then I would say he just plays harder consistently from, you know, from drive to drive, game to game. Um, I just I, – I don't see Aiden Hutchinson ever take a snap off – and I see it quite a bit with Thibodeau in just about every game that I've watched. So from that standpoint, I, again, I'm picking up there. Ozzy used to always say there's nothing wrong with doubles, you know, like just guaranteed doubles. And a lot of times those doubles turn into home runs. I'm just trying to eliminate as much risk as I possibly can. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, okay, so um, NFL Network is going to have uh, scouting combine coverage uh, starting this week and continuing all week. The on-field workouts begin Thursday uh, with quarterbacks, wide receivers, tight ends. On Friday, it'll be running backs, offensive linemen, special teams. Saturday is a big day, linebackers and defensive linemen. And the reason I think it's a big day is that Hutchinson says he wants to do everything. And this yep. is his chance to put a little exclamation point on him being the first pick in the draft. So, and, and, and one of my favorite things, Mike Mayock started it, you do it too, that I think is really fun about the combine on TV is that at some point in your, I guess, 50 hours uh, of combine coverage, you will take a deep dive into all 32 teams and what you think of them, what you think they need, where you think they might go, both in free agency and the draft. That's my favorite thing of you just giving the status report of mm-hmm. every team in the league. And I think that 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 really is a it's kind of a it's 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 a tease to tell everybody, hey, listen, 
they they might be talking about uh, they might be talking about the Cleveland Browns at five fifty eight on <laughs> Saturday between you know defensive linemen and linebackers. So you better not turn it off. But and 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 I often think I said this to Mayock once: you got to do more homework on the teams themselves than you do on these three hundred and thirty six players or whatever they are. Yeah, what's funny is it's not. <laughs> It's, tr- it's like running a race on two different tracks because you're trying to, you know, study these guys, all the tape and all the hours that that represents. And then but then you've got to answer from the team side. That's why that's why I get my little handy dandy sheet right here. I've got all my teams. I've got all I've got free agents. I've got stats. I've got needs. Um, I've got all that stuff a little front and back is my, my little crib sheet here as we go through these teams. And the best part about it, Peter, is I'm going to I'm going to have hours and hours of discussion. Uh, on TV, on podcasts, on radio interviews, then free agency happens and it's all worthless because all these needs and everything completely change. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's worthless, but I say it really it does change <laughs> after free agency. But you know, but still, I think you know. I mean, one of my favorite teams this year just to watch is the Ravens because yeah. they're going to have seven picks. When you start at pick number, I think 76, they have seven of the next 70 picks. And knowing DaCosta, general manager Eric DaCosta, he might make a couple more trades to give them eight or nine. But the the Ravens really seem this year to be in the sweet spot of the draft. It's, It's not only that. It's not just the ability to pick the players that they've had tremendous success with in those rounds going back 20 years. Um they've turned those picks into guys like Calais Campbell, you know, like they, you know, Marcus Peters, they, they find ways to use those make middle round trades picks. and yeah. they make trades. And it's just, there's so many ways to build your team and acquire talent. And, you know, look, they've, you know, there's, there's a handful of teams that are just better at it than everybody else and utilizing the resources and the Ravens are, are one of them. Danny Jeremiah. Thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks, Peter. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.